Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for All About Android is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to All About Android, episode 96, recorded on Tuesday, February 12th, 2013. We are your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Gina Trapani. Yay! And, uh, you know, we were going to have Ron here. He was expected to be here. He had to cancel last minute. Unfortunately, real life got in the way, as happens. I think we both agree, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, Life we happens. understand. Life totally mm -hmm. happens. Uh, so he's got a pass. He'll be back next week. He assured us of that. We'll see, Ron. We'll see, because you listen to this, right? Don't you? All right. I'm pointing at you, Ron. Um, but we do have an awesome fill-in guest host. Welcome back to the show, Russell Hawley. He's the mobile editor at uh, geek.com, and you just write a lot of cool stuff. It's awesome to have you back on the show, Russell. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Uh, we had a lot of fun last time. Absolutely, absolutely. Been looking forward to uh, bringing you, have, having a reason to bring you back on, and this is uh, as good a reason as any. We've got a lot of cool stuff to talk about today. Uh, obviously, earlier today, Android 4.2.2 kind of started pushing out, so we'll uh, give you the update on that. The long-term Ouya release plan, which I think is kind of interesting, uh, we can discuss Nike Snubbery. Uh, and a whole lot more. Uh, just a lot of really cool stuff uh, to chat about today. So let's not waste any time. Let's dive right into the news. So Android 4.2.2, which is basically a bug fix. I shouldn't call it a bug fix because there are a couple, a couple of new features. But an update to Jelly Bean started rolling out to Nexus devices this week. The Nexus 7, the Nexus 10, the GSM, Galaxy Nexus. And also the source code got pushed to, I always want to say ASOP, but it's actually AOSP, the Android Open Source Project. Uh, that code got committed. And uh, it's there are quite a few bug fixes, but a few new little features as well. Um, the the settings area has uh, the ability you can to can toggle settings now. So when you pull down your settings area, if you do a long tap, you can toggle up several of the settings. Uh, app downloads have kind of ni nice new uh, estimated time for download notifications. Um, just improvements, so you get an idea of how long uh, an app is a better idea of how long an app takes to download. Um, it's got a couple of new sounds and it's got fixes for Bluetooth audio issues. It's also got a kind of a nerd a nerdy new feature, a, uh, an ADB uh, debug whitelist, right? So when you connect your, your Android phone to your computer, it asks you, it says, hey, here's a fingerprint for this machine. Do you want to allow this? And this is kind of to, to prevent uh, someone from stealing your phone or, or grabbing your phone and, and plugging it into a computer and, and you know, basically downloading all your data without your, without your permission. Uh, it, no word in the Nexus 4, and I actually have the GSM Galaxy Nexus, and I have not gotten this update yet. I am very impatiently tapping on the, uh, you know, <laughs> check for system updates button. But th there are ways to manually download it. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to go the, you know, yeah. the regular kind of path and just get the OTA like everyone else. But apparently it is, it is rolling out. You know, have you I gotten it? I well no I haven't I uh, I'm stuck with the Verizon Fallacy Nexus oh I'm sorry Galaxy Nexus um, yeah so I haven't gotten it but you know I'm on CM or Cyanogemod uh, 10.1 so I'm sure that's going to get updated pretty quickly uh, yeah. what about you Russell I have a GSM Galaxy Nexus and a Nexus 7 and neither one of them have gotten it officially yet and I've been I have both files downloaded by the end of the by the end of the night, I think I'm going to push it over manually if uh, the update hasn't happened. Yeah. We get yeah. impatient. We just want these updates. Although, yeah, like you said, Gina, it doesn't really seem like, uh, you know, a, probably aside from just general kind of bug fixes across the board, it doesn't really seem that there are a huge amount of like, you know, wowie uh, type type new features. Although the, the tapping to toggle and the quick settings... Like yeah, I, the, the, the long I, tap on the, on the settings, that's kind of nice, right? So instead of tapping, say, like, Wi-Fi and then launching the Wi-Fi settings, then tapping on and off, if you long tap on Wi-Fi, then that will toggle it on and off. That's just nice. It saves you saves you a couple of taps. Just um, definitely need, it's also kind of interesting that Android had been, like, moving away from long press for a little while now, and mm -hmm. so they're kind of moving back to it now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. So the difference is instead of me just tapping it and it toggling, I now have to long press it? Oh, misunderstanding. Yeah, it's good. Uh, yeah, let me see. Make sure that I'm not misunderstanding. Because look, because you're toggling it on and off just by tapping it now. I mean, 
there are some settings in here that toggle by tab, uh, but then there are other ones that I've noticed that that don't. Although I'm not like Bluetooth might be one of them. Okay, so uh, you can long press on or the maybe. Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi squares to use them as actual toggles. This is different I from see. other power controls. Is normally press to toggle and long press for settings. Um, so right. this is so right. So you can either I see. So ah. you get the long long press to toggle and then single press to launch settings. So it's, it's one one way or the other. It gives I, you both both bits of functionality. I see why I'm getting twisted. Sideways, I'm in the chat room. Says uh, Cyan Jamad changed that behavior. So what ah, I'm seeing okay. is probably You're what, in the future. I guess why. so. I'm living in the future. I got so used to the future that when I saw this part of the change log, I was like, wait a minute, doesn't it do that already? Oh, but, right. Yeah, because I'm tapping my, and that just launches into settings. So, okay. So yeah, I, you've, already, you've got the cyanogen uh, goodness. Yeah. Uh, so I, basically, that's that's coming to that's coming to 422. That's the thing that I'm most excited about is these is is the quick toggles, mm -hmm. uh, that launching settings. That always seemed like just a. A, a uh, long trip to do something very similar. Yeah, yeah and kind of kind of an awesome. obvious thing that was mm -hmm. was missing, um, which you know, and also some Bluetooth audio fixes. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned that or not. And I know that was a big complaint uh, for users of 4.2 uh, is just like audio hiccups on playback through Bluetooth devices. Not everybody experienced it, but enough people did. Supposedly, yeah. that's fixed with this update. So. Hope and so. this is interesting. Android police spotted that Google updated the estimated battery life for the Nexus 7 from eight hours to 10 hours, right around the time that 422 launched. So they're sort of speculating that maybe 422 has some battery life savings, you know, so some, some more efficiencies built in that would save battery life, uh, in which case, you know, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Nice to be able to, you know, use the same, the same hardware more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. And then I, you know, I already called it the fallacy nexus. Uh, now four, four updates behind doesn't matter much to me or to a lot of people I'm sure watching the show because, you know, a lot of us just kind of root and ROM and, and do all that sort of stuff. But if you jump back to what you were talking about earlier with the USB debug whitelist, those of us mm -hmm. that root and ROM our devices, this kind of, you know, security measure isn't necessarily as secure um, on those devices because our devices are inherently insecure because of that root access. So uh, keep that in mind. Some of these features uh, can you know, might not apply so much if you're doing what I do with my phone, apparently. Yeah, good point. So, Well, but you're a cyanogen mod user, which means you can actually turn off root access. Oh, I need to do that. I haven't yeah, used cyanogen a mod in a really long time. I actually just switched to it like four or five days ago. And now that you've mentioned it, I remember reading about that uh, a while back. That's right. So I'll have to do that. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so in other news, Google Nexus Force, kind of speaking of, they have not released any official uh, figures as far as sales figures were concerned. And as everyone here probably already knows, the Nexus 4 didn't have the smoothest launch in the world when it came to placing orders and uh, getting it, you know, getting a, a solid order devi uh, device delivered to you at, at an early time or even before the holidays and everything. So they were kind of plagued by that. Folks at XDA have come up with a little bit of an analysis around the IMEI numbers on Nexus 4 devices and uh, came up with an unofficial way to estimate the total number of devices sold. At the end of December, that number was around 400,000 Nexus 4s, but now it appears to have surpassed 1 million devices. Um, I'm curious to know what you guys think as far as total number sold Galaxy ne or the uh, the Nexus 4 hitting 1 million. It's obviously low when you compare it to a device like the Galaxy S3, which back in January was uh, 40 million devices sold, I believe. So this is, you know, well, obviously 1 40th of that. Uh, but not bad, I, I suppose, when you consider all of the troubles that it had at launch and how, how it hasn't really been on sale for very long, all the stock issues. What do you guys think? Is that a good number? Seems low, although yeah. I mean they haven't had they haven't had nearly the marketing power be behind the Nexus Four that you know that Samsung's but put behind its its handsets and like you said it had all those problems it kind of missed the holiday the holiday rush uh, but it seems low actually it's interesting the way that they calculated this they they're they're analyzing the IMEI number and mm -hmm. kind of making assumptions based on you know <laughs> it's not it's not like they increment <laughs> exactly but they figured out kind of what parts of the of the number represent what and kind of um, and estimated from there. I feel yeah. like this is a number that Google was really proud of that we would know about it. Like True. Google would do an official release, right? So it's I don't it's 
Not that I don't believe it, uh, but it does seem low. Yeah, and I believe Google has even said, uh, you know, they haven't said anything official, obviously, but they've even said they were very happy with the sales for the device. Um, don't know if that's just kind of PR spin or what. Yeah. I, I can't imagine sales for the device were anywhere near what they anticipated it would be. Um, because, yeah, I mean, like we've already said, it was plagued by so many issues coming mm -hmm. out of the gate. Russell, you have a, a Nexus 4, right? Not here with me, but yeah, I've... I've and uh, I've used one a couple of times um, over the last couple of months. Uh, the, the the phone itself, I mean, it's I think that they've done pretty well as far as sales. I think one million is definitely pretty low. Um, and I, I think when I went and looked when they first said that when they first gave the 400,000 number, I went and did a little bit of research on how the guys at XDA were were counting all these numbers. And there was a lot of discrepancy when it came to the numbers that T-Mobile was purchasing and pushing. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they only had uh, a handful of, uh, of phones from T-Mobile, you know, and, and that was right after T-Mobile had uh, started putting the Nexus 4 in all of their retail locations. Uh, so I definitely think that the number is, you know, it's it's cool that we can you know kind of peek into this a little bit, but I, I I'm really curious as to how close to accurate it really is. Yeah, I completely agree. It kind of seems like a like a little bit of magic, like if we you know <laughs> like numerology, and and I realize you know these things actually have kind of thought put into them, but it's hard being on the outside, I imagine, and being super accurate when you're just analyzing these numbers and you know coming up with these assumptions uh, and being anywhere near accurate. I'd love to see how accurate they are. Uh, it's original purpose, I think, was really cool. I mean, the, the whole point behind these numbers originally was to, these guys got together to try and uh, track down bugs that were happening on specific Nexus 4s to see if uh, they were, if it was a batch issue, uh, if there was, you know, a, like a bad batch of Nexus 4s. And that was where this whole thing started, was trying to collect all this information to see if it was, you know, all the phones that were made from this point to this point, you know, at, at this manufacturing facility, mm -hmm. then they would be able to go to Google and say, look, you know, we have all this information you guys should should do something about it and it's kind of blossomed from there mm -hmm. hmm. cool interesting well from the nexus 4 to the nexus 1 gina <laughs> back to the nexus 1 the nexus 1 is about to blast off into outer space a uh, project that started 2 years ago um, which was to send a smartphone into space with this, with a satellite at the time that the project team which is based in great britain wanted to pick the best smartphone available at that time it was the Nexus One. Well, that Nexus One is launching on February 25th of this uh, this month. And this is the first time they, they sent smartphones into space before to, yeah. to figure out whether or not they could actually work. But this is, this is the first time that a smartphone is actually going to control the satellite. So the first phase of, of the flight, it'll collect data uh, from the satellite. And then this is, this is my favorite phase. Then the, la another phase of this flight, uh, the satellite will start to run or, or the smartphone will start to run apps chosen via a Facebook competition. Scream in Space <laughs> is an app yes. that will use the phone's speakers to test the theory that in space no one can hear you scream. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I love that. Um, cool. Members of the public will be able to upload videos of themselves screaming, okay? And the most popular will be played on the phone and recorded using the microphone. <laughs> that is uh, so great. Th this is this is really really cool. I'm, I'm I'm interested to see how this flight goes. This whole project, like I said, based in Great Britain, the cost um, the estimated cost was two hundred fifty thousand pounds, which right now Google tells me is about almost four hundred thousand U.S. dollars, and came in right at budget. And uh, I can't wait to see if uh, anyone can hear you scream in space. I love it. Uh, That's it, February 25th. <laughs> sound pollution in space, thanks to the <laughs> Nexus One. Uh, if it could just go around like playing like the uh, the theme song to uh, 2001 just all the time, <laughs> that would be even better. That would be that would be awesome. Um, I wonder, you know, battery wise. Uh, it, I mean, this this seems like a short term project, right? They're just kind of sending it up, doing doing some stuff, but it's not going to be up there for a long, long time. That's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I'm not sure yeah. that they said how long the flight would be. It seems like it's got to be long enough just to kind of try these. I mean, I imagine yeah. they've got a few backup batteries going on. Um, yeah, it doesn't say when what it'll when it's coming back. Yeah, battery wise, yeah, who knows how they're gonna power that phone for that long? We have a hard enough time getting through a day. Well, uh, it doesn't even have to be on like for launch or anything because the Nexus One was one of the last phones that HTC made where you could uh, you could trip the power. Uh, to the device from the USB port. 
Uh, oh. So they can actually they can actually turn it on and off from the USB port, which was something that HTC uh, stopped doing with the Nexus One. And the only reason I know that is because I broke the power button on my Nexus One and had to use that <laughs> anytime I needed to reboot my phone. <laughs> you had to plug it in just to get it to turn yeah. on. Awesome. Well, at least you had that capability, man. Oh, it was great. And when I got my next phone and I broke the power button on that because that is a problem I have, I was really sad when it didn't happen. It's like the old school uh, blowing into the, the Nintendo cartridge type fix. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> it's thinking on your feet. I it, love it. It looks like a, a follow-up to this project will involve two Xbox Kinects that will attempt to dock the satellite in, in space. Uh, so the Kinects will kind of scan the area and get, get a sense of, the, of where it can dock. Uh, so that's going to happen after the Nexus One flight. Nice. I love it. Nexus One in space. Uh, we have a voicemail. I love getting voicemails. Jonathan uh, left us a voicemail and has a kind of gamer's perspective on the Amazon, uh, Amazon coins that we talked about last week. Hey, Triple A crew. This is Jonathan from Oaks Ferry. I just want to comment about the uh, Amazon coins that you guys were mentioning in the last show. One thing I had noticed, you know, and anyone who played an MMO and knows what virtual currency is all about, um, but when they actually price the elements or not elements, the items in the store, um, they usually price them a bit high from what I've been, you know, able to notice. And I guess that is because of that abstraction that uh, Gina was talking about. You're, you're disconnected from the actual value of the product that you're paying these coins for. You know, you got 500 coins for a single item. It's $5 real-life money, but what, is that item really worth $5? So thanks for all you do, and have a great day. Yeah, and that that could be the case. Although I think Amazon said that the dollar value of the things in the store are represented equally across dollars as well as their special coins. So I guess that's where it gets tricky. Is if is if Amazon did have different prices for these items based on if you're paying with coins versus if you're actually paying with with money, I guess. So right, yeah. I think it was one coin to one cent. Yeah. It seems like coins is more of a gift card play, yeah, whereas that's... something like Xbox Live points, you know, points don't necessarily, you know, represent money. You know, that this sort of more of an abstraction. And I agree that like abstracting it out into assume some other currency makes you less give you gives you less of a sense of how much it actually is worth. You know, mm -hmm. how much would I pay for this in a store with actual money? Mm -hmm. And that works to the retailer's advantage for sure. Absolutely. Agree. Um, well, we have a lot in the hardware section, so let's dive in. So, uh, a few gaming uh, things here. First of all, the Wikipad, which I feel like we've been hearing about for a long, long time. It was supposed to launch officially, I think, late 2012. That didn't happen. Uh, but it's getting official. The 7-inch version is, anyways. $249 this spring, they're saying. It's going to launch with 4.1 Jelly Bean. has an NVIDIA Tegra 3 inside, 16 gigs of RAM. It's uh, definitely a gaming device first, uh, but they say it's also, you know, a fully capable tablet. And there is a 10-inch screen version that's being revamped to be released at a later date. Uh, just, I, I'm just loving that we're seeing more along these lines of like the, the gamepad, kind of like the Project Shield, the gamepad approach uh, for Android devices. I'd be very curious to see how these do in the long run. Just gaming in general with Android seems to kind of be in a maturing stage right now. I don't know. What do you think about these portable devices? Not much. Oh, <laughs> Apparently. I, was, I wanted to give Russell a minute. <laughs> it's hard I didn't to want to say. <laughs> what do you think, Russell? It's hard to say because, I mean, you, you're talking about, you know, $250, you know, so you're looking at $50 more than a Nexus 7. And the hardware is pretty yeah. similar, if memory serves, mm -hmm. uh, to the to the Nexus 7. So it's really, you know, we've got the, the gaming aspect down where we've got these kind of high-end, you know, graphics machines, Tegra 4 devices coming out, you know, probably by the end of this year. But there's, it, it seems like even with uh, Project Shield, that like portability isn't a thing anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, these can be, you know, slung in a backpack or something, but they're not, they're definitely not pocketable. And I think that that's going to be a detractor. Yeah, not to mention the, the portability that we have right now are the devices that we already have that also play a lot of these games. Too. Right. So um, you got to be really kind of all in on the form factor 
part of this um, more than almost anything else. It's kind of part of why you're getting this. There are also, you know, ways to turn your phone in, you know, to have a, a controller similar to this as well. So are they necessary? Maybe they're not. Um, I, I suppose this is, you know, this year is where we're going to kind of see whether it has legs because uh, there's a few of these coming out right now. So. It looks like, I mean, the, just from, from the photos, it kind of looks just like a tablet with, mm -hmm. with pa you know, with gaming pads on it. You know, like I, I'm looking at it and I know a lot of, I'm not, I'm a very, very casual gamer and I've actually never owned like a handheld, a handheld held device. So just, just some context, but it looks weird to see a, a, a gaming device with like Chrome, you know, on, on the home screen. I mean, I know a lot of gaming devices do come with browsers and have cameras and stuff, um, but I hope that they, or imagine that they would kind of skin Android or sort of make, make a sort of game, a game centric Android uh, home screen kind of experience mm -hmm. and not make it look like oh, I'm going to check my Gmail on this thing that has a joystick. Right. What? You use the joystick to move a cursor across the screen and select your <laughs> icons. Archive. Archive. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. Like to report spam. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I, I suppose we'll see. Email uh, inbox app. That, that's a game I would play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's an on-screen keyboard and you just, you know, hover over to the letters. Uh, yeah. That sounds like fun. That sounds like my PlayStation. Great. Um <laughs> So, Gina, on the other side of the token, we have the devices, the actual, uh, you know, devices that plug right into your TV. And, and uh, one of the big ones right now is Ouya. Yeah, the Ouya, which I love to say. Ouya. Ooh Ooh yeah. There's going to be a new Ouya every year. We, we talked about this on last week's show. The Ouya is that Kickstarter-based, uh, set. Uh, I guess you shouldn't call it a set-top set box, but a, a small kind of cube-ish-like cube, cube -ish -like thing that you connect to your TV uh, that's Android-based. It's going to be, it's it's launching in big retailers. I want to say like so Target, Best Buy, 99 bucks. Yep. Turns out there's going to be a new Ouya every single year. There'll be an Ouya 2 and Ouya 3. Um, they're basically planning to follow the, the you know, the mobile phone sort of path, upgrade path, uh, instead of kind of your regular gaming consoles or your usual gaming consoles. I mean, I, I, I've got an Xbox 360. I haven't touched it in years and years, and it, and it still works really well. Um, and the Ouya folks said, you know, they're going to take advantage of faster, better processors. Um, they're going to take advantage of prices falling so they can get more uh memory in the box they will do that and you know when i first saw the story i thought like who wants to upgrade their gaming console every year uh that would frustrate me but they they said there will be absolutely be uh backwards compatibility that the games that you purchase will be attached to the user and not the console itself and i have to say you know when, when you're selling something for 99 bucks i think you could probably afford to do an update every year right Cause it's it's not like it's it's that big of an investment as a consumer yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I think it. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting approach for them to go in the direction of the mobile devices. And I mean, you know, even the the people that are super passionate technophiles, you know, upgrade their like like iPhone, for example. I know I know plenty of people, Sarah, um, that will up upgrade every year because you know, I mean, a she does a show about iPhone, but b I, I'm pretty positive she'd probably do that anyways, just because she wants the newest, the latest, greatest technology, and that's a pretty darn expensive device to do that with. And I know she's not alone in doing that. So people are willing to do this uh, when the device is ninety nine dollars to begin with. This uh, this this gaming system that's not a bad price, and they've also said that they want to bring it lower if possible. If it you know if if it gets to the point to where the components that they're putting into the Ouya allow them to lower the price and make it even even less uh, to upgrade every year, then they go for it. Um, what I wonder about is the backwards compatibility assurance. I think at a certain point that kind of has to break down, right? It I mean, has it's still to. running on Android. So, yeah, so if this is going to work, if the Ouya is going to be fantastically successful and users love it so much that every year or even every other year they want to upgrade, um, that means that there are going to be some awesome games getting released, right? And games that require more memory, you know, or that run faster or better or take advantage of maybe new technologies. So and, and that are going to maybe break backwards compatibility a little bit. Maybe it won't be a big deal because it's a $99 device and maybe less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but and, and you know, and I appreciate. I, I mean, I think it's great that they're saying we were go, we are going to be backwards compatible. Uh, but at some point, you know, particularly with the games that are going to get released, you're, you're going to see games that that require just just you know meteor machines with more memory to run really well, and that that'll be the thing that'll make people want to upgrade. Yeah, and I mean, even just even just the newer Ouya systems, if they're releasing every year, there's a new version of Android every year, so they're built on Android. 
They're always going to be built on the current version, I hope. Um, yeah. Which, I mean, if that's the case, then there are plenty of things that run on Ice Cream Sandwich and up that don't run on anything beforehand. Russell, what do you think about this? Did you uh, Are you all in on the, the Ouya craze? Or? I'm not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's a cool idea, and I like that they, they're, they're hitting all of the – the, the kind of hot button things in order to be successful. The backwards compatibility thing, it, it's a Tegra 3 in the first edition Ouya, which means it's already kind of behind yep. uh, when compared Agreed. to the the new Snapdragon and Tegra 4. So the next generation of hardware is going to take advantage of some of these really g- great games that are being made for the new hardware platform, and there's no way that the first generation is going to keep up. Um, have you, you played with the Droid DNA? Yes, absolutely. I spent a lot of time with it. Loved it. There was a game that came uh, pre-installed. The, the name of it escapes me. Uh, that came pre-installed on the Droid DNA, and it took advantage of the Snapdragon S4 Pro uh, to do some really intense graphic rendering. And one of the crazy things about that game is that it's on Android, but you can't install it on anything right now because it requires really intense hardware. That uh, the the DNA and and I think one or two other phones are the only things that it can even run on right now. Hmm. So when it comes to the the really high end Android gaming, which is going to be the thing that is going to excite people when it comes to plugging it into a television, I think being able to announce backwards compatibility at this point is is not something that is going to benefit them in a year. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it kind of seems like a promise that sounds great on paper and that people really want to hear, really want to believe. I just don't know it, how how possible that's going to be, particularly in two years, one year maybe, two years. That's uh, that's a lot of time. I mean, how long has Android been around? Three, period. But even then, if you're you're looking at a ninety nine dollar console changed. that you're upgrading every two years, yeah. that's really not bad. I mean, nope. when you consider that the, you know, the the pricing for a lot of the the next generation consoles are sounding a lot like four and five hundred dollars for the baseline model, you're you're getting out if all you're really interested in are these you know kind of mobile style games. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, in uh, other hardware news, we have the LG Optimus G Pro, which uh, appears to be a, link, a leaking ship uh, these days here, uh, ahead of Mobile World Congress, which is kind of when we think this is uh, is going to be unveiled. The specs are 5.5 inch screen. Actually, there's a there's a photo of the alleged device, um, supposedly from the Korean carrier LG U equals or U. Equal sign. I don't know what you say there. Um, but anyways, uh, just an interesting kind of design design approach. Uh, looks, you know, a lot of people are saying looks uh, similar in many ways to the Note 2. Uh, definitely the 5.5-inch screen kind of lends it uh, that way as well. Uh, 1080 by 1920 full HD IPS LD, LCD screen, 1.7 gigahertz quad-core Snapdragon, uh, LTE 2 gigs of RAM, 13 megapixel rear-facing camera, a 3140 milliamp hour battery so it's a pretty nice battery i love that we're seeing more of these high capacity batteries and I, I hope that we continue to see those in more and more devices um you know thin bezel slim super slim physical home button so you're probably not gonna end up with a little verizon logo on that sucker thankfully um and yeah just kind of looks like a decent decent device for for lg there you know many people are saying that this would be their next kind of big phone to rally around I don't know. Let's just get either of you guys excited. No. Looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> LG. I don't know. I'm just, I'm still not sold on LG. Even though they have the Nexus 4, I haven't spent a whole lot of time with the Nexus 4. People seem to love it. Aside from that, I haven't really like been been excited about LG phones. The Optimus G is, is a really nice phone on paper, uh, and, mm. and it definitely uh, has a couple of really great features. Its uh, battery management is fantastic. But uh, they they skin the operating system like all the other manufacturers do, and it, LG tries really really hard to pull the kind of the best from all the other manufacturers and and stick it together into this thing that they they kind of try and brand as their own, and in a lot of cases it just ends up being clumsy. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the, the Nexus Four is really great because it takes the you know it, it is the stock Android to the great hardware that you're seeing from LG right now, and it is really nice hardware to hold in your hand and really comfortable. But the the operating system you know uh, enhancements, for lack of a better word, yeah. that, that LG is implementing right now, I'm personally not a fan of. Mm-hmm. And I th- I think that's kind of the impression that I've gotten from the few LG devices that I've played around with is that their overlay leaves uh, a lot to be desired. As well. Uh, Gina, I think we found your next phone. 
<laughs> what do you think? You know, I, I've got 10 grand laying around, and I'm yeah. thinking, like, what I really want to do with this 10 grand is buy uh, an Android phone. Uh, made <laughs> an of outdated titanium. Android phone. <laughs> an outdated Android phone made of titanium and sapphire. Oof. And you know what? I could do that. I could do that because Virtu, who would, a manufacturer which is known for, for making sort of luxury yeah. devices, is has announced its $10,000 Android phone uh, running ice cream sandwich. This this is this is not <laughs> that remarkable a phone. Android Central uh, uh, reports there's a 1.7 gigahertz dual core processor, an 8 meg megapixel rear camera, 1080p video recording, uh, ice cream sandwich, which, as we know, is kind of outdated. But Virtu's banking on what the phone is made of, and that is that the uh, the chassis is constructed from titanium, and the screen is sapphire crystal, which Sounds like you're not going to be able to destroy this phone if you if you even tried, even if even if Leo fell on it uh, after breaking the chair, <laughs> danced on top of it. It's going to survive. Um, yeah, and I guess customers who buy this phone for ten thousand dollars, an ice cream sandwich phone for ten thousand dollars. I just just wanted to make sure that you caught that. Uh, they get access to Virtu's concierge service, where they can call uh, a phone line and ask for things like restaurant bookings and for local local advice. So think basically Google Now, but for for ten grand uh so so yeah money to burn there you go ice cream sandwich <laughs> google now for free google now for 10 grand for 10 grand with a uh, real person on the other sapphire. side yeah, google I now mean, versus alfred yeah right, <laughs> right exactly. <laughs> and a few others in the call center and this uh, i mean the photo of this phone there's one on android channel I mean, this thing is it just it looks like it's just trying so hard to be fancy just so hard to be fancy uh, uh uh, yeah, I, I used I used to do a show when I was at CNET called Gadgets, and pretty much, I guess the best way to describe it is a, a kind of gizwiz over at CNET. Maybe slanted more on the on the female side because you know both of my other co-hosts were were Molly Wood and um, you know Lindsay Turntine, Kelly Morrison. We we did a lot of riffing on devices like this, and purely because they're ridiculous. I want to know. And now, it, now it's in a show that that I I like to think is maybe a little bit more serious. I want to know who's paying ten thousand dollars for an Android phone. Who who does that? Does one person do that in the world? Apparently so, because they sell it. It blows my mind that someone would pay ten thousand dollars. More importantly, for a phone. how long will it be until we read the story about this phone being left in a bar? <laughs> <laughs> no, that won't happen because no one's going to own this phone to leave it in a bar. <laughs> it's never going to happen. I don't know. If hey, we have a lot of we have a lot of people who follow the show. If you happen to buy one of these, please send us a photo and just let us know what you oh, think okay. of it. Give us a review. We will absolutely put that in the show. Yeah, take a picture of yourself with this thing. Seriously. I mean, wow, ten thousand dollars. It's a lot to blow on a phone that's gonna that's already outdated. Um, but it's really nice looking. Kind of. But if you take a picture of yourself, make sure you take a picture of yourself in like sweatpants and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the rattiest t-shirt you own. It's like, yeah, I live in a cave, but that's only because I spent every dollar that I have on this phone. So at least I have the phone. Um, let's see here. Just a few more things before we hop to an email here. The HTC M7, uh, it's reportedly, you know, it's, it, it's kind of a lot of rumors and and everything have been bubbling up we've talked about it a little bit last week ahead of their uh, HTC's February 19th event in New York City a render is now hitting uh the web so if you want to take take what might be uh, a look at the uh, M7 go ahead and take a look looks nice it's got that kind of edging uh that diamond cut edging that you see on I believe it was was it the iPhone 4 or the iPhone 5 the iPhone 5 5 yeah and uh, so that looks a little similar, but um, but I think it looks like a nice device. Um, yeah, I like I like how the black kind of stretches to both sides, and it's kind of just got the top and bottom a lighter. I don't know. I guess you probably get it in different different colors. Um, it's 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 a cool looking device. Yeah, uh, definitely seeing you know the the trend has been the smaller bezel on the sides, and this is seeing that as well. There are also rumors around HTC sticking with the same naming scheme as their line last year the one series and just calling it the htc1 so if that's the case it wouldn't be the m7 it wouldn't be the htc1 plus plus 
B or you know however they want to go ahead and tack on letters to the end of it as as uh, manufacturers seem to like to do uh, if this rumor is accurate it would just be the next HTC one how do you guys feel about that as far as kind of a marketing kind of structure for uh, a flagship device Russell what do you think well I think that uh HTC One doesn't sound like it comes after HTC One X. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So in a, in a store, when someone goes, well, wait, <laughs> you know, uh, naming, you know, for for Android for any phone really would dictate that the thing that has something after the word one would be uh, further along. But uh, I think if they're going to, you know, have it be one phone that exists on all four of the carriers. Then you know having that that universal name, regardless of what it yeah. is, is going to be really important, and it'll also be the first time that HTC's really done this for Android. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that trend. I think obviously you know the the Galaxy S three really proved that that's a smart way to go. I think with the S two, it was the S two, but it was the S two skyrocket, or you know it had all these kind of addendums to it based on what carrier it was on. And Galaxy uh, S two Epic four G Touch. There you go. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> prime the, example. The Android ecosystem is just plagued with these really yeah. awful long names. Uh, I really like HTC One. I'm simpler is better, so it sound that sounds good to me. It might be a little confusing, but uh, so much better than I mean, there's AndroidNameGenerator.com. Like you just go and see. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> see all the different crazy names. They're all very believable. Yeah, totally. Uh, so. Yeah. We, we've been beaten down at this point, so we'll believe it all. <laughs> hey, there we go. All right. Yeah, the HTC go. Wildfire Optimus. That <laughs> sounds like the LG MyTouch Optimus S. Oh, the Samsung Fascinate Black Prime V Pro. That is my <laughs> favorite device out on the market right now. Uh, excellent. I know I've seen that site once before, but I forgot about it. It's hilarious. Uh, all right. And then finally, Gina, something that we've been waiting for, at least Nexus 4 uh, uh, owners have been waiting for possibly. That wireless charger, the really cool kind of orb that kind of got sliced in half. It looks like they took a Nexus Q and just kind of sliced it in half. That wireless charger is now in the Google Play Store. It is $60 and it will ship in less than one week. And it's killing me because I want that thing on my desk. Uh, and I haven't given in and bought a Nexus 4 yet, but it just looks so nice. So I guess when you when you put the phone on, on the wireless charger, it launches into daydream mode. Uh, and it just looks, it just looks so, so nice. Uh, so yeah, 60 bucks shipping now. Finally, Nexus 4 owners. It really does look like they just kind of took their supply of Nexus Q stuff and just went like, oh, yeah, let's just put this back it. here. Yep, exactly. <laughs> hey, and that's hey, it's more power to them. That's smart because the Nexus Q was beautiful in design. It was, uh, it was for sure. Design. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I like the way this looks better than the Palm Touchstone, just saying. The Touchstone mm -hmm. was a little simpler, although it's also $6 on Amazon, so big price yeah. difference there. But Yeah. But you uh, can't charge your Nexus 4 with a Touchstone. I've tried. Oh, you can? It's not powerful oh, enough. Oh, man. It's so does it even give any charge whatsoever? It just you get the give... magnetic attachment, but the Nexus 4 doesn't do anything. It, no care. No one cares. <laughs> but it holds the phone to the to it the does. thing, right? Okay. The, the magnet part works just fine. Awesome. <laughs> now with more magnet. Uh, excellent. All right. So don't get the touchstone and think that it's going to work because it's not going to. Uh, let's take a quick email here, Gina. Hi. Uh, this is this email is from John. He says, "I hi AAA team. I need some help." I have a friend who's getting a new phone next week and has been fully invested in the iPhone and, app and, and in Apple for years. However, he wants to try Android, but he has one issue stopping his conversion. His office uses iMessage exclusively and can't be without it for the collaborative nature of it. Is there any way for him via an app on Android to integrate seamlessly that's into iMessage? He's not too impressed with the iPhone 5, so he wants to switch, but simply won't if he can't solve this issue. He does not want to ask everyone else to switch to Gtalk, etc. Thanks, love the show. That's John from Concord, New Hampshire. <sighs> Bad news. Yeah. Bad news, John. There's just there's just no integration for Android for for iMessage. Uh, it's it's just there's a lot of services that do a similar thing to iMessage, but but if if it means migrating the whole office over, if if that's out of out of the question, it's just not not going to happen. Um, 
Apple, yeah, just has has iMessage like like you said here at the top, Jason. Thank you. Apple has iMessage servers locked down pretty hard, and there just isn't integration with, with Android. I, I got nothing on this one. We can suggest apps that do something similar, but like you said, if he had to change his whole office over, and that's not an that's not a, an option, then kind of out of luck on this one. Yeah, it's not sounding very good. Um, a lot of people have Facebook installed on their their devices, uh, so you could try and get them to move over to Facebook Messenger, I suppose. I don't know if that's yeah. necessarily an analog, but mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. yeah, if, if the goal is to get some sort of iMessage solution on Android, I I mean, I did I did some searching. Someone could correct me out there and say, oh, well, this might do it. But as far as I know, there's nothing that directly talks to the Apple servers and gives you true kind of access into that world. Uh, yeah, if anyone listening has found something to, to you know, that, that, that talks to iMessage servers, I have very doubtful that they exist, but let us know. Yeah, absolutely. AAA at twit.tv. All right, let's get to the apps section of today's show. All right. Do you like Nike? Do you like the Fuel Band? If you do and you have an Android device, you are SOL. Uh, back in March of 2012, Nike mentioned through their Twitter account that Android support for their you know, pretty popular Nike Fuel Band was going to be available in summer 2012. Summer 2012 happened and it passed. No Android app. Flash forward to now, we've still not seen that support. Nike took their Twitter account once again and uh, said definitively that they are focusing on iOS and web components, leaving Android in the dust. Um, this sucks. I know. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> Let's just say it. This sucks, especially a company as big as Nike. Totally. Hug. It doesn't make any sense to me. Like, you don't have the resources to make this work? Like, how many people, do, you know, design and, and develop for the Android platform? Not to mention how big and broad the Android platform is. You're, you're cutting yourself off at the foot in this case. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about this, Russell? It's really hard to run without your foot. <laughs> that's true. So that's, the fuel ban wouldn't be useful to you anyway. That's true. I, uh, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> heed the warning here, please. Um, yeah, it just, I, I don't know. It just doesn't add up to me. Like, why why would they choose to to do that? Is it, is it just hard developing uh, inter-device apps for Android versus iOS? My understanding is that the fuel ban connects via Bluetooth, and Bluetooth profiles for Android are a little nuts, mm -hmm. uh, when it, especially when it comes to communicating across the different... Uh, uh, the different OEMs. Uh, Motorola had problems for a while there, uh, and I learned this from talking to the guys from uh, Sphero, that Motorola and HTC both handled Bluetooth really differently for a while. So anyone who doesn't have current generation uh, uh, devices from those manufacturers are going to run into problems communicating via Bluetooth uh, for, for devices like this. Uh, whereas new uh, devices, you really should focus on Bluetooth uh, you know, 4.0 and move forward, but that limits you to a, a number of devices that you can actually support because not, uh, it, it's really only the ones that have been released this year. So like, okay, so that, that makes sense, but isn't that, isn't that better than just eliminating Android entirely? Like at least at that point, then it's like, all right, going forward, we're pretty likely to say, I mean, it's kind of like the, the cutoff of, of, of developers who just start developing now and say, well, my app only works for, you know, for ice cream sandwich and Ford for whatever the reasons are. And I think to a certain degree, people accept that because they're very different. You know, gingerbread, the cut between gingerbread and ice cream sandwich was a pretty significant putz, uh, uh, cut. So it, okay, that makes sense to me that you would only support this going forward. It's kind of the same thing here, right? I think that they should probably pick one, you know, really popular uh, set and move forward. And it's not like that would be hard. I mean, if you yeah. if you work on the Galaxy S3 and move forward, then you've got a pretty reasonable chunk of users who would be interested in, in throwing money at you. Totally. But to just walk away entirely seems like a bad plan. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to just take out take one of the developers or PMs on the on the Fuel Band project out for a drink and hear exactly what happened. Especially since they kind of said that they were working on it and then reversed their position. Did they start to work on it and something went so and it was so horrible that they decided to do a, you know a U turn on it? Is it did they just uh, underestimate how much support the iPhone version would take and just didn't want to similar to you know like what happened? Uh, and they're not really saying, but this is weird and it kind of sucks and it sets a bad precedent. 
it's it just it sets a bad precedent for other companies be like well nike's you know ios only um and we've talked about this on the show before the apps that go ios only this idea that that, that you know that, that it's a certain class of users that aren't represented on android i just think it's such a is, is a fallacy mm-hmm. uh so um i would love to know what the, what the whole story is I, I wish that nike would be a little more specific about what you know why right um now scooter x is is posting a, a few interesting uh kind of clips into the chat room related to this from Fitbit, which is kind of a related uh, wearable technology uh, type solution, similar to this anyways. From Fitbit, they say, currently the Android OS does not provide apps with access to the Bluetooth 4.0 chips in newer phones. To work around this, some phones instead have custom software that provides access to Bluetooth 4.0. Since this software is different for each phone, our team has worked on developing a solution for each phone independently. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. that... I suppose that could be part of it. Um, earlier on Tech News Today, they were, uh, you know, the the TNT crew were kind of uh, bouncing back and forth on the fact that the Fuel Band has tight integration with iOS devices. That maybe there's some sort of, you know, not that there definitely is, but maybe there's some sort of exclusivity behind the scenes that has kind of emerged over that time. Uh, right. you know, where Nike's kind of bought into that as well and just said, you know what, just iOS devices. But ultimately, it doesn't seem like a very wise uh, wise move going forward to eliminate such a large pool of, of users. Well, yeah, they're just going to have a lot fewer users. Yeah. All right, Google Now. I know you're a fan, Gina. I am a big fan of Google Now. It looks like there's a Google Now widget uh, that possibly got leaked on Google's own help pages. Google has their their kind of their support areas. I call them the dot .py, the dot .py pages because all the all the URLs are are Python files. Um, apparently, this showed up in their help pages. It's just just a kind of simple Google Now widget. Google Now is awesome. I love it. Uh, but this is a widget that would sit in your home screen and give you information from from Google Now, and uh, it looks like it was leaked because the couple of Android blogs reported on it and then it looks like there was there was not very much documentation and then that support page got pulled. So uh, not sure if this is going to be part of an OS update or if this is, you know, if Google Now is going to be, you know, uh, released via Google Play and it's going to be an update via Play, but we might see a Google Google Now widget soon. It looks like that's, that's very likely. Yeah, I like the look of it too. Um, you know, because, I mean, I can only speak for myself on on the Galaxy Nexus sometimes sometimes swiping up to get Google Now to pull up isn't necessarily an immediate thing you do it and then you wait yep. a few minutes and then you wait for the tiles to, or the uh, the the cards to populate and then mm-hmm. you you see the thing uh with a widget I would know immediately that it's 45 minutes to home and uh that's kind of yeah. cool sometimes that's what I'm looking at looking for so to have it there uh automatically would be pretty sweet uh or on a lock screen you know if you throw that on your lock screen uh, Definitely, cool. I would use it a lot more. I, I sometimes I just forget, you know. It's like, yeah. oh, right, yeah. Swipe up for Google Now. If it was sitting right on my home screen, I would use Google Now a lot more, and that's what Google wants, uh, right? And, and Google Now is just asking to be. I mean, it's really useful when when you do when you do sort of launch it and check it out. So I would love to see this. I, I want this yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then Plex Media, uh, what you got on that, Gina? Yeah, Plex Media Center uh, has gotten completely rewritten. Uh, Elon, who's one of the, the, the lead programmer on the Plex project, uh, wrote a lengthy, actually, blog post about the differences of developing uh, or or what it's like to develop on Android. Up up until now, he said that it was really pretty difficult and awful, but um, he said that, you know, Android came so far so fast and that right now it's really a pleasure to develop on, and as a result, the Plex Android app has been completely rewritten. It will be released this week, so I haven't actually gotten a, a chance to see it yet. But what I'm really excited about, I'm actually a, a, a pretty, I'm a pretty regular Plex user. I run it on my Google TV uh, to watch media from my different different machines around the house. And the thing that caught my eye is that Elon, who's the lead there, said we didn't just set out to make a great Plex Android out. We we set out Android app. We set out to make the most beautiful Android app period. Uh, They said they spent a lot of time studying Android's design guidelines, and that sounds really promising. So I'm excited to see this. And actually, yeah, there's a video there that you're you're playing. Um, They said that yeah, that the, the it's just a lot, lot faster. Infinite scroll, the media loads really fast. Uh, just a lot smoother and complies to Android's design gu- guidelines and even makes them better. So I'm I'm excited about this. And this is going to be this is like I said going to come out in Google Play this week, but it's for Plex Pass only. 
a Plex Pass is a, a, a kind of a premium premium uh, feature. And then when it comes out of beta, it will be free to everyone. Nice. That looks great. And so um, so this is for your, so this is running inside Google TV. Um, so you have to launch it. I, I haven't used Plex, so apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. No, no, it's okay. You have to yeah. launch into it like you would a normal app. And then that kind of takes over the Google TV experience essentially. Yeah, exactly. It's basically, okay. yeah. So, so you run, you run like a Plex media server. So say on my Mac, I've got all my media, I run Plex media server and then on my Google TV, I launch Plex and I can, uh, browse through all my media and it does all the things that you would expect it. It downloads all the, mm -hmm. you know, the cover art and then the summaries for episodes nice. and movies. And then you can stream from any device kind of in the house that's running the, the, the media, the media server software. So Ron and I were talking about this last week cause we yeah. talked or a couple weeks ago, we were talking about, um, the XBMC release and he was saying that he, he, he really likes XBMC because you don't have to run that extra media server with Plex. Uh, so, and, and Plex, I think, is actually a fork of XBMC. Uh, but I, I'm kind of interested to see to check this out because Plex has always had a really kind of, I, I think, a really beautiful interface, mm -hmm. media center interface. One of these days, I'm going to get off my butt and get a Google TV. Dang it. I need to do that. <laughs> Russell, do you yeah. have one? I do. I have the Sony internet player. And are you, do you find that you use it a lot and it, it's kind of your go-to solution? Yeah, it's well, it's I have a love hate relationship with my uh, Google TV because uh, I also have it run through a TiVo. Um, so the interface is amazing because it allows me to control the TiVo and everything from my phone uh, without having to use, you know, switch back and forth between all these different apps. Uh, but up until recently, there was a it really was kind of hard to uh, to use, you know, pretty much anything other than than Plex and the, you know, the version of Chrome that's on there, uh, without running into to some kind of issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been using since the Logitech review, and it's definitely come a long way. It's it's kind of frustrating sometimes to see that Google TV isn't quite the priority that I hope I wished it would be. Yeah, I think it was even last I/O where I went into I/O and I was like, you know what? I really want an I.O. where one of the big parts of emphasis, pieces of emphasis, is Google TV, where they're like, this is a Nexus Google TV device. Right. Because that would show, like, okay, we're committed. And I think what we ended up, well, I know what we ended up with was the Nexus Q. It was like, is this, is it, no, 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 no it's totally not. Um, so, again, I, I suppose I'll be, look, you know, hoping that they kind of make that a priority um, this year at I.O., uh, I suppose that remains to be seen, but yeah, I agree. I would, I would love to see them focus on a little bit more because when I hear people talk about Google TV, it always kind of seems to be the same thing. It's like, yeah, it promises a lot and it does some things really well, but it doesn't do the other things very well. And that's why I don't use it all the time. No. So, yeah, I, I also have my up to the TiVo as well and kind of switch back between them. It doesn't it doesn't do everything well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, I, the, the the new Plex app is actually 3.2 Android 3.2 and better. And specifically because they wanted it to run on, on Google TV. And that's one difference between this and XBMC, which right. does not run on Google TV. Right. So. Cool. Uh, well, let's take a quick email before we jump into the arena here. Uh, Jose. Ja ja I should have said this to myself before the show. Jose Jacobo, uh, Android and web developer, said, Hey, crew, just wanted to pitch in my two cents about a recently rediscovered Android tutorial website that I used a lot during my first app development. The website is called mobile.com. Tuts plus T U T S P L U S dot com for tutorials, uh, which as you can probably tell is an extension of the huge Tut Plus website. It has all kinds of tutorials from iOS to Android, from Corona to Sentia Touch, etc. Basically everything mobile development. Their tutorials uh, have different ranging levels of difficulty from walking uh, from walking you by hand on setting up you know, your development environment on your home PC to creating custom views on Android. They, the teacher in the in your email mentioned that he was looking for more hand-holding of sorts. This is definitely this place, although if he doesn't know anything about programming, it might be kind of a, a steep curve anyways, uh, regardless. But that's mobile.tutsplus.com. I know I've gone to, to uh, Toots Plus for... Uh, for tutorials on things like After Effects and stuff, and their tutorials are really well done. And I mean, they're just all there for the watching, you know, very long, very detailed. Uh, they do a really good job kind of parsing it out and letting you know, you know, 
what you know, what is your skill level? This is pro this is going to be good for you. This is going to be very difficult for you. And uh, these uh, tutorials look like no, no different. So if you're thinking about getting into Android development, this would be a, yet another kind of great resource to check out. And uh, Jose, thank you for sending that in. This looks great. And it covers more than just Android. So uh, check it out. All right, let's uh, waste no more time and get to the arena. So many enter, <laughs> but only one lives. Android Arena. Boom. Whoa. Okay, did you just pull this up right now? This is uh this oh. is this is kind of oh. crazy. Uh oh. I, expect I this... looked at it earlier. It was nuts. Was oh. it? Oh. I believe we Man, have a tie. That. How is that possible? Is this <laughs> has this happened before? I don't know if we've ended up with a, a pure tie, but we. It, I mean, this is going to change, so I'm going to call it right now. It's a tie. Uh, this is going to change as someone watches this and goes, oh, I'm going to vote for one or the other. Uh, this is what we have. Fast Burst Camera and Reddit News Free tied uh, for first place at 35% with 220 20 votes each. Uh, carbon for titter, uh, tw Twitter, <laughs> close second, 29% at 184 votes. There you go. Okay, going to move on. Uh, so that means that, let's see here. Normally, the the losing app goes first. Was So that carbon was you, right, Gina? That was me. I'm the big loser this week. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move <laughs> I'm going to move you up to first place. You get first place. All right. Uh, go ahead and uh, show off your app, and I'll, I'll uh, run it for the first time here, and uh, I'll walk through it with you. Big L, big L. Okay, so my app <laughs> for the arena this week is called Silence. Uh, it is, you can get one version that's free that has ads, or you can pay $1.99 to get the version without ads. And so Silence is pretty simple. Basically, it hooks into your calendar, your Google Calendar, and you can set events or you can you can you can control your settings based on calendar events right so this is very similar to what you'd see with like tasker or locale but the thing that silence does is that it hooks into your calendar uh so you launch up you launch silence and you say add an event and you say add an event manually like hey i'm gonna sleep tonight between midnight and five in the morning uh or you say add an event from my calendar uh which will bring up your calendar and then you choose an event from your calendar and then during that event you can set um triggers or, or, or i forget what actually what what they call it um i think it's is it triggers um, it's hard for me to see your screen um yeah new event and so you can say during that event uh do something change change a setting right so for example one of the events on my calendar is that i do all about android at 5 p.m from 5 to 7 every, every tuesday i don't want to take calls during the show right so i can i can add an event Add, say, choose all about Android, and then I could say turn off my ringer during that time. Um, or, you know, I read, a, I read a study that your mobile data on your phone, if it's activated and your phone is by your head when you sleep during the night, uh, it, can, it can affect your sleep quality. So you can say, hey, during, you know, the time that I'm sleeping, turn off my mobile data connection or just turn my ringer off. Uh, so this is, like I said, it's very similar to functionality that you're going to get from something like Tasker or Locale, this, this you know, time-based system setting changes. Uh, but what I like about Silence is that it's calendar, it's hooked right into your calendar. So it's like, so you can say the meetings that I have every week or the show that I do. Uh, and it's just simpler, you know, Tasker, we've talked about how Tasker has a pretty complicated user interface and it doesn't, there's not a lot of configuration involved uh, just really simple during these times do this to my phone and when this time is up do this you know turn my ringer back on turn mobile data back on etc uh, so yeah super simple two screens that's it that's silence that's great I love it uh, it's got a it's got a very kind of no-brainer interface to yeah um, yeah toggles I'm sorry I was saying triggers it's toggles so you, you choose an event and then you set up a new toggle and you say turn up my ringer turn up my wi-fi and just you can just change certain settings so that's what I like about it it gets it gets to the power of something like tasker but in a yeah. clean simple interface that's that's hooked into your calendar yeah I mean uh, tasker is no doubt very powerful 
uh, but also not the easiest thing to use. Even though they've 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 done their kind of recent um, hollow. I was corrected in email. It's not holo. It's hollow. For some reason, I always call it holo. Uh, the the recent hollow um, kind of interface redesign, but it still has a lot of kind of complexity to it on how you set it up. Um, and I mean, one honestly, one of the main things I use Tasker for these days is for silencing my device based on different situations. So this might be a better sol solution for me. Uh, right. This is, this is the silence is just time based so you can't do you can't do like proximity stuff but it's right. you can't time based uh, uh, so it's it's really more for that so you'd want something like okay I'll task her to say you know when I come home sure. do this. Uh, but I like silence because it was pretty pretty simple and for someone who doesn't have a lot of time to fiddle with settings uh, it's it's a qu quick and dirty way to just say turn off my ringer during the show yeah, yeah, exactly um, I should have had this earlier today on Tech News Today I was uh, <laughs> correcting off? a camera and my phone was ringing back at the TD desk. I was like, whose phone is... Oh, mine. <laughs> so if I had this, I would have been saved. Uh, so that is silence, free with ads or $1.99 without. Uh, Russell, you are up next, and I believe I have your app as well. So I'll go ahead and show that off. Go ahead and talk about it. Cool. So I went with uh, a new one. It actually, I think it was actually released earlier today. Um, and I uh, I couldn't believe what a good job it was. It's a dash clock widget. Uh, dash clock widget is uh, designed by one of the guys on the uh, Android team. Uh, they they do a lot of the Android developer hours, and uh, it is it, it sounds so simple because it's just a it's a, a a widget for your it replaces your clock and replaces your notification setup for things like uh, missed email or weather or something like that and you can set it as a uh, lock screen uh, widget like you have there and it's just really simple and really pretty and the menu for it is just incredibly basic and and super simple so as a as a first glance at just about anything uh, you can set up uh, email, you can set up weather, you can set up missed calls uh, for lock screen or for, you know, on your desktop. Uh, just a really clean, well done application. I can add missed calls, next alarm, text messages on top of the ones that I already have here, weather, calendar appointment, Gmail, unread count. Yeah, I've been liking this too. I installed this uh, as well. Here, I'll go ahead and lock and unlock. And uh, you have kind of the minimal display up there. And then if you click it and pull it down, you get more of an expanded view of that. And your hour number isn't twice the size in terms of font kerning as your other numbers. Uh, <laughs> did that, did that design choice no bug you? And I couldn't <laughs> stand that. It was so bad. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, there's no rational reason for it to bother me, but it bothered me so badly. That's so funny. Yeah, I know that's... Noticed that, and now it's going to bother me. Now that you pointed that <laughs> at it, going, can't like, be unseen. <laughs> is, it can't be unseen. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. That's that's like people love it or hate it. It's a total love it or hate it type thing. People either love, you know, or, or don't mind it, or uh, are like, what is going on there? It doesn't really bother me that much, but. I, you know, again, I'm I'm happy to have it not not there as well. But the the widget is great. Um, its simplicity is its strength, and it's early on as well and free, so you can't you can't pass that up. So, uh, cool. So that is Dash Clock Widget, and that released very uh, very recently, just a couple of days ago. I'm gonna go ahead and cover something that was released, uh, I think yesterday or today, I can't remember, but it was honestly, it was like a last minute, like, you know what, I'm going with this one, type one, and thankfully I did create the graphics, so you should have it in there, Chad. Uh, it is called Shapes and Sound, and actually, it's sound, so I need the audio cable here. Let me see. If Leo uh, falling on the table didn't break the audio connection, then. This is gonna be one of Jason's awesome games, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's it is awesome, and it is a game, and it is mine. So I guess so. Yeah. Uh, so it's okay. So let's see here. Shapes and sounds. I have the audio piped in, so hopefully you can get it because the soundtrack is pretty great on this game. So basically, it's a uh, pretty simple. It's uh, you know totally playing on the strengths of kind of the the kind of old school game format thing that happens to be you know pretty popular right now um you have a shape in the center of the screen once we get to the menu here and shapes just kind of start falling towards you if the shape matches the shape that you are you do nothing and you get points when it hits you 
If the shape is something different than what you are, you have to shoot it and destroy it, kind of like in asteroids, right? So you got your screen here, got circles coming. I'll go ahead and let those hit me. Got a square there, I'll shoot it. Triangle, ah, I missed. Um, so you basically have to get them before they hit you, and if enough hit you, then, uh, then well, that's bad. Um, it's strength is, again, it's, it's simplicity. It's very uh, straightforward. The music is kind of lulling and you know you might fall asleep uh, some of the shapes are a little bit bigger so you have to hit them multiple times you get these hearts uh, to kind of raise your score there um, but it's just kind of a nice you know straightforward time wasting uh, game with very simple graphics Ooh, huge uh, but I don't know I like it a lot it's just a lot of fun the more you play it you know obviously the, the faster the objects kind of come to you come towards you and you just have to kind of do your best to uh, tap them away and and everything. Not a whole lot to it. It's not, yeah, and the soundtrack is great. Um, it's just kind of takes you into another world in headphones particularly. Play this game in headphones, you know, kind of get lost a little bit. Um, but it's only 99 cents. It's in the Play Store. It's pretty, uh, it, I mean, it's very new. Uh, and it is an Android exclusive game. It's launched on Android. Uh, so, you know, it's always kind of nice to see, game, you know, strong games that do that. And uh, yeah. I like it. It's, it was a lot of fun the first time I picked it up. It's very easy to understand, too. It's very intuitive. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's easy to play. It has a lot of difficulty built into it as well. So it is shapes and sound, 99 cents ah, in the Play Store. And uh, yes, I could play this for quite a while, but I'm going to stop because I have a show to do. There we go. <laughs> I like that it's just black and white in the lines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's well, the design choices are, are nice. They're totally. minimal and clean, but they're they're fun, too. Totally. Um, I'm realizing now that the poll, which I'm going to go ahead and vamp uh, for just a second, might actually read the wrong uh, apps because of, because of the last minute switch. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. But as I stretch it out, I'm going to say that normally you would go to AAAPoll.com slash 96. When you go there, you're going to have a poll that shows you all the things that you can vote on that's accurate and not uh, inaccurate as it is right now. So let me edit it. <laughs> I do like fun. that the, the headphone recommended thing is becoming really uh, just uh, popular in Android right now. The, the Android games that are coming out, was, I think it was uh, the last one I played was uh, Sorcery. Um, it was another one where as soon as you turn the game on, it says, you know, you're really going to want headphones for this. And it does. It, it adds a completely second layer to uh, playing the game. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. You see, definitely seeing this more. Um, great. It's not letting me change it. <laughs> no, it changed. It's updated. Oh, did it? Oh, it gave me an yeah, error yeah. message when I did it. So, okay. No, no, no. So, it's, it's, yeah, it's dash clock, shape, and sound, and silence. Man, I think I'm sweating a little. Um, okay, good. <laughs> All right. So, triplepoll.com slash 96. Thank you for, for your help. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. A little, give or take a few votes on this one. Hopefully, it won't be as close as it was this week. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, all right, cool. So that is it. Uh, vote for your favorite app, Dash Clock, Widget, Shapes and Sound, or Silence. Three strong apps this week, as usual. Um, that's it for this week. Uh, I think this was a pretty jam-packed episode and really appreciate Russell. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on. Uh, it was Thanks, awesome. Russell. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. And we'll definitely be in touch again for a future show because we love having you on. Um, but this is your opportunity to kind of plug what you got going on. What do you have going on? Um, so I uh, I write for Geek.com full-time. I do pretty much all of their uh, mobile stuff. Um, I, I try to focus on Android, but every once in a while my boss likes to pick on me and give me other stuff to do. Um, so you can you can find you know most of my stuff there just uh, geek.com uh, and I'm uh, I'm on Google Plus a lot more than I'm on Twitter, but you can find me on Twitter uh, at the the tag there and then just search Russell Holly on Google Plus and I'm pretty easy to find there as well. Awesome. Right on Russell. Thanks again. Sweet. Yeah, uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. And Gina, what you got going on? Well, I hope that people will check out my app. It's to do txt.com. It's a text based task list that just syncs to Dropbox. Uh, but also, I co host this week in Google here on the Twit Network. That's on Wednesdays, and we air at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. I do it with that with Jeff and Leo, and uh, that's a lot of fun. It's some Android, not all Android, but it's, it's and a lot of Google. Uh, so that'll be tomorrow. And that's it. Cool. Chad, quick. 
Um, <laughs> I love taking you by surprise. <laughs> I know. I never know when. Um, I do a show about Minecraft. I also TD a lot of shows uh, here at the Twit Network. If you want to check out my Minecraft show, you can go to omgcraft.com. Thanks for watching. Boom. Uh, and just a big thanks to all the folks in the chat room that will catch us live. Uh, you guys saved us a couple of times tonight. Uh, you guys are, are awesome and really appreciate you tuning in live. You can tune in live as well if you want. Every uh, Tuesday starting at 5 p.m. Pacific, live.twit.tv. Uh, come and, you know, be in the chat room and watch the show live as we record it. And you can kind of pitch in on a conversation, too. It's always very active. Uh, but you can find me at about.me slash Jason Howell. I'm also Jason Howell on Twitter. And I'm on Google+. Plus. I try and post there as much as I can because the community is there is, is awesome as well. Um, but as far as the show is concerned... Thanks again for watching. Voicemails can be left at 347-SHOW-AAA. You can leave us an email or a video mail. Just basically post it to a place like YouTube, attach the link to an email, and send that to us. That's AAA at twit.tv. I love video mails. If you send it in, you're probably going to get played on the show, so do that. Uh, Twitter, you can find the show at, uh, at Android Show. There we go. Show notes at twit.tv slash AAA. You can also find past episodes there iTunes, YouTube, we're all over the internet. Uh, and that's it. I suppose we will see you, uh, if we're lucky, next week for another episode of All About Android. See you guys. Mm, jelly beans. Oh, There's none in there. <laughs>